Thanks very much. It's always better to get the clap at the start because you never know what's going to happen at the end. <coughs> um, when I started on this topic, <coughs> um, I suppose I did, I looked at it and looked at the issue of lifelong learning through the lens of equality. Uh, and I started by looking at the European Union priorities and the Irish national priorities for, for lifelong learning to just get my bearings in the field. And I suppose it was a bad start because <coughs> the lifelong learning priorities and the areas where progress are required make absolutely no mention of equality, make no mention of equality as a priority in the area, make no mention of equality as an issue that has to be progressed in this field of lifelong learning. And that, I suppose, is strange in a context where inequality of educational status is rampant in, in our society. If we look at people with disabilities, one quarter of people with disabilities have no formal education qualifications versus about 6% of the national population. If we look at travellers, over 60% of travellers have primary education as their highest uh, level of educational status, which compares with 20% of the national population. And that inequality, of course, leads to inequality in our wider, wider society. And we do live in a deeply unequal society, a society where 28% of the income is earned by only 6% of the population, a society where 1% of the wealth is, <coughs> or 1% of the population holds 20% of the wealth. <coughs> and that's a society, I suppose, that not only needs equality in education, but also clearly needs equality for education if we're to build the knowledge, the skills, and the value base we need to, to emerge as a more equal society. My starting point, and I suppose the framework I take for looking at the topic, is the equality legislation. And there's two elements to that, I suppose. Uh, there's the Employment Equality Act, which prohibits discrimination and harassment in the area of employment and in vocational training. There's the Equal Status Act, which prohibits discrimination in the provision of goods and services, in accommodation, and in education. That legislation covers nine different grounds, and I think that's a useful framework and one that appears to be being used uh, today. The nine grounds of gender, marital status, family status, age, sexual orientation, disability, race, religion, and membership of the traveller community. And I think we have to add a, ten ground, a tenth ground, and we do need a tenth ground, in terms of socioeconomic status as a, as a key marker and definer of inequality in, in our society. To look then at the topic, <coughs> I want to identify three sets of problems. Problems in relation to education, problems in relation to equality, and problems in relation to the recession and how we're managing the recession. And problems, these are obviously problems for lifelong learning. In terms of education, the, the, the core problem that immediately jumps out from my experience is that, surprisingly, there are very strong indicators that education is a site of very significant levels of, of discrimination. If we look at the annual report of the Equality Authority for 2007, which was the last year it had uh, its maximum funding, the highest area of case files under the Equal Status Act were in the education sector primarily in primary education and secondary education, and primarily on the disability ground and the traveller ground, but also on the gender ground, the religion ground, and the sexual orientation ground. We could also see a high level of case files in relation to access to vocational training under the Employment Equality Act, principally on the age ground, but also on the disability ground. Employment in the education sector was the third highest sector of discrimination claims under the Employment Equality Act. Again, age emerges, disability emerges, gender emerges as, as issues. If we look at some of the research data, James Norman in 2004 found that 79% of SPHE coordinators reported an awareness of homophobic bullying in their schools. They also reported that 90% of the bullying policies in those schools made no mention of sexual orientation and homophobic bullying. The ASTI in 2009 did a survey of post-primary teachers and found that more than 25% of them were aware of racist incidents in their schools, but also found that 30% of the schools had no formal procedure to respond. So in terms of education, we have a problem of discrimination. In terms of the provision of lifelong learning, we can be sure discrimination is, is an issue. And I suppose there are three aspects that strike me in relation to that. The first one is that educational establishments aren't gearing up to their responsibilities to prevent and eliminate discrimination. They're too busy. It's not a priority. They don't have enough resources. All valid arguments, <coughs> but the reality is there are legal obligations, and the reality is if the value of education is to be given true expression, the resources that are there must be used to eliminate and, and prevent uh, discrimination. 
But also, you find a funny phenomenon in educational establishments, <coughs> not all of them, but you have a public sector ethos, you have a pupil-centered ethos, you have a very strong value base of good intention and strong pro-people uh, values. But I think that's a value base that makes it hard to see when things are going wrong. That if my intentions are good, I don't take challenge very well that actually maybe what I'm doing is not so good or not so useful. So good intent and good intentions end up as a barrier to change uh, within the sector. Also, there's a strange mix as well in terms of a professional ethos or almost authoritarian ethos, particularly in the formal sector. And I remember always being told at every stage, whether it's in Pavi Point or in, in, in the Equality Authority, you can't teach teachers unless you're a teacher yourself. Now, that's an extraordinary barrier to learning, an extraordinary barrier to change <coughs> uh, if we're to move from an education system that does discriminate. If we look at the area of equality then, discrimination is a barrier, <coughs> but also our very ambitions are a barrier. Our, the scope of our ambitions is a barrier. Again, looking at the Irish priorities and the Irish areas where progress is needed in lifelong learning, there is no mention of older people. <coughs> and yet we know that 63% of older people from 55 to 64 hold less than upper second level qualifications compared to 45% of the overall pop population and yet we don't mention older people. There's no evidence in the Irish priorities or the Irish areas where progress is needed of a comprehensive, 10-ground, integrated approach to equality and to lifelong learning, serving a more equal society. However, most striking is <coughs> that the only area where equality gets a type of mention is where the Irish priorities talk about improving equity of participation, treatment, and outcomes. Now, participation, treatment, and outcomes is a good framework. Equity, however, is deeply problematic and represents a very low level of ambition in relation to equality. Equity is about fairness. It's about equality of opportunity. It's about a model of equality that says <coughs> everyone should have access to some level of minimum entitlement. But after that, the competition for advantage will be governed by fairness. Now the problem with it sounds nice, <coughs> but the problem with it is that it can and does coexist with significant and persistent inequalities. It ends up justifying them. If the competition for advantage is actually fair and I uh, remain disadvantaged, <coughs> well then it's my fault. So we begin blaming the people who experience inequality. It's also a model of equality that promotes tolerance and tolerance of what we call difference. But tolerance <coughs> is about putting up with something that's a problem. Tolerance coexists and can coexist with contempt. Tolerance requires no understanding of, of, of difference. So we need a new ambition <coughs> within lifelong learning and within policy making around lifelong learning, an ambition for equality of outcome, a concern with achieving real change for groups that are currently experiencing inequality, a focus on groups and what's happening to groups in our society as well as individuals. And above all, a focus on systems and how we organize lifelong learning, how we organize education, rather than on individual behaviors and individual uh, practices. The third problematic area is the area of, of recession. We are, I'm sure you'd be surprised to hear, in an economic downturn. And we have problems, I think, in how we respond personally to economic downturn and how we respond politically to economic downturn. In, in, a, in a context of, looking personally first, in the context of economic downturn, fear is a dominant factor. It's almost purposefully generated. But when people are fearful, we draw back into ourselves. We look for traditional securities uh, to carry us through difficult times. It's not a time when we're open to or willing to change. And systems and institutions are exactly the same. They draw back into themselves. They go back to do what they know best. They're not open to change. And yet, in a context of significant and persistent inequality, we urgently need change. In, in a context of recession as well, we're all managing scarce resources. And inevitably, discrimination becomes a tool for managing scarce resources. And it is interesting to note in, in debate, public debate, how, how notions of deserving and undeserving have come into the debate. And deserving and undeserving is a code for discriminating against particular groups that we end up deeming as undeserving. However, even more relevant, I think, for our discussions today is the barriers that emerge to lifelong learning from the way this recession is being managed. <coughs> Three things I'd highlight. One is the approach to the public sector. <coughs> There's a, an, a, an overt campaign, I think, to vilify the public sector, to cut wages, obviously, in the public sector, and to cut back public sector services. And that's a choice 
Uh, we could have raised taxes, but we choose to vilify and diminish and damage the public sector, which is a key provider in, in this area. We don't assess the impact on equality. We don't assess the impact across the 10 grounds. We reduce key services. We cut wages and demoralize uh, staff. We create a context where people are too busy to get involved in inequality issues. We create a context where people end up just having to manage large numbers of disadvantaged people, but not really having the time, space, or resources to tailor to their particular needs or to the needs of their particular group.